Okay, so this is our competency assessment. Um, just looking again at the biological, psychological, and social aspects that you've gained through the assessment process. Um, so just an example, biological family history of depression, um, also family history of substance abuse. So his mom it said that she used alcohol and she also used pills to help her sleep and to help her anxiety, her nervous, her nerves, as she put it. Um, psychological, you know, focus on some of those things that he presents with is that he's irritable. Uh, he also had wild uh, spending sprees where he would buy cars and then give them away right away. So those are, you know, two things that would fall under that. Social, um, in our case, so he spent many days alone, so he really isolated himself. So that's important to note. And he's also getting divorced from his wife, or has been divorced from his wife, which his close friends actually refer to as the period where he went downhill. That was sort of the final straw that sort of led to the culmination of problems. So um, assessing for competence. So he was still able to work. He did cancel some tours, but he was still working and touring. Um, he was admired and loved by many, uh, many people, fans, other people in his life. Um, he has the money to pay for services and for the treatment that he needs. Uh, he does have close friends who care about him, and he was self-sufficient. So those are some uh, positives that we can build off of in the treatment plan. And then just a quick touch on the uh, attachment style. We weren't really sure because it didn't give a clear picture of his childhood, but based on what we had, we went with ambivalent, resistant. He was preoccupied with caregiver's ability and he was in a meshed relationship with his mom. They were very, very close. But then at the same time, later on in life, she wasn't there for him, stopped talking to him. So some of the things that that would look like if you're ambivalent, um, resistant, attached style as an adult, one thing would be become very distraught when relationships end, which is very applicable to this case because when his relationship with his wife ended, that was very distressing for him and that's when a lot of the problems came up. So his developmental stage, his actual age, about when he went into the ER would have been 40, which would have been middle adulthood. Um, but based on his emotional um, maturity and where he's at in his life, we put him that he's probably still in early adulthood with the unresolved intimacy versus isolation. Because that was a big problem of his being isolated, not knowing who to trust. So. And now I'm going to, uh, Sarah's going to talk a little bit about his diagnosis. All right, thank you, Megan. Okay, so now we're going to dive into Elvis's diagnosis. And I know Matt gave um, a brief overview of the 11 classes of substance related disorders at the beginning. And now I want to take the opportunity to go in a little more in depth into both opioid related disorders and also sedative hypnotic and anxiolytic disorders, which are the two that we chose to focus on for Elvis' um, diagnosis. And so opioid related disorders, um, as Matt said in the beginning, there are three types. There are natural, semi-synthetics, and synthetics. Um, they're used as pain relievers, and this can be after you have an operation, and they can also be used to alleviate chronic pain with illnesses such as cancer. Um, they're often obtained illegally, and you also find that um, individuals will go in and exaggerate what their medical concerns are or fake them in order to obtain their prescription from their doctor. Um, and the examples of these are morphine and heroin and oxycodone. And going into the specific culture, age, and gender features, we see an overrepresentation of minority groups with opioid dependence, specifically in impoverished areas. And this has been from the 1920s on, and prior to that, in the late 1880s and the early 1900s, we saw a rep representation of individuals of middle class, specifically women. Uh, there is speculation that there could possibly be increased risk for opioid dependence with medical personnel because they do have ready access to the drugs. Um, and then the male female ratio is 1.5 to 1 for opioids other than heroin and 3 to 1 for heroin. The prevalence, um, these are some of the statistics. I don't want to read over those, so we'll go into there. Get to the good stuff. Um, and then the second or, um, class that we're going to focus on for Elvis is sedative hypnotic and anxiolytic related disorders. Um, and as not done, there are three different types of drugs, but they're bunched together because their effects are similar. Um, sedatives are calming, hypnotics are sleep inducing, and the anxiolytics are anxiety. Um, examples of those are Xanax, Clonopin, and Valium. So again, going into some of the um, culture, age, and gender features. It's most likely for individuals who are in their teen years or in their 20s to be taking these to get a high. 
Um, these drugs have effects on your cognition and motor coordination, and we see that individuals with dementia. This can have um, increased risks for intoxication at lower doses because of their old age. And then there is a possibility that women are at higher risk for prescription drug use, specifically from drugs from this um, class. Prevalent benzodiazepines are the most widely used by individuals who are hospitalized for um, medical care. Um, again, prescribed use for these med medications is greater in women and it increases in age. So now going into Elvis's diagnosis, um, this was a long process for us. And it was really interesting and we went back and forth and um, the way that we decided to start it is look at where are all the symptoms at and we practice in, this in classes. When you're reading through case studies, you might want to jump to a certain diagnosis, but we really wanted to spell them, spell them all out and really look at um, what this might be, what he might be presenting as. And the issue with co-occurring disorders oftentimes is that it's difficult to determine whether or not um, the symptoms are substance induced. So Elvis was using a large amount of um, prescription drugs and he was also presenting with symptoms that are representative of mood disorders, such as um, manic symptoms of wild spending sprees. He was buying cars and he was selling them. He was giving lots of money to charity. Um, he was also spending days and weeks in isolation. And so we weren't able to determine while he was still intoxicated whether or not these symptoms were substance induced or due to another, to a um, medical condition, et cetera. So we wanted to um, draw your attention to the rule up. These are things that would be focused on as he continues going through treatment and as we um, are able to better um, determine whether or not it's from substance use. And then also something is that at the hospital, um, diagnosis, we diagnose them with intoxication. And the reason for that being is because with a dependence diagnosis, there would have to be evidence of effects of withdrawal, and he's coming in intoxicated, we can't necessarily judge that at that point in time. And also you can see that there are two diagnoses up here. And the first one is hospital. So they're mostly the same, all good to in inpatient. Um, the hospital, we put his GAF score at 35, and the reason for that is we were going back between doing the 21 to 30 range or the 31 to the 40 range, and we, we decided that he does have impaired judgment and there are significant um, problems, but he's still um, functioning in the fact that he has a job, he has a house, he has a place to sleep at night. So we put him at 35, and then we just, the GAF score raised two points when he was inpatient because that's the understanding that when he enters into the ER with, um, with at, uh, he's at his lowest point. Um, and then also for the inpatient diagnosis, we added on mood disorder not otherwise specified. Uh, and these would be the, the rules on the bottom would be some of the ideas that we might have for what his diagnosis might be. Also, environmental and genetic influences. And so in the case study, a lot of you guys mentioned these different um, factors playing into his life. Elvis's twin was born stillborn, and that had a great effect on his attachment to his mother and also the way in which his mom attached to him. Um, his father was incarcerated, and that led to a distant relationship. And there, were also, um, addic there was addiction with his father, likely abuse of alcohol, and then we also read about um, his mother's depression and his mother's addiction. 